Good day, my beautiful, beautiful people. Today, we are going to see the fall of a dynasty, the fall of the Romanovs. We will examine Tsar Nicholas II, who we've seen before, look at the rising discontent that Russia suffers during the First World War. We will look at the effects of the war in general on the Russian people and the empire itself. Finally, we will look at the February Revolution and the rise of Lenin, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Let us begin in our last lesson, we saw the Kaiser, who is increasingly under the control of the silent dictatorship, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, make a very, very fateful decision. Actually, two very fateful decisions. The first is to resume unrestricted submarine warfare, as well as support the sending of a secret telegram to Mexico, the Zimmerman Note. That's the first giant mistake because it brings the United States into the war. However, Germany is certain that even if the United States enters the war, they have time. They have time. The United States is going to take a long time to mobilize. They thought this before about Russia, remember, with the uh, great offensive, um, the Schlieffen plan. But that being said, he makes another gamble. He makes another gamble. Okay, the Americans, they can enter the war. I have another trick up my sleeve, and that was smuggling in a Bolshevik agitator to try to bring down the recently installed provisional government of Russia. We're going to look at all of this. Just remember that. Because with this smuggling of Lenin, we will see the fall of a 300-year-old dynasty. We will see the collapse of the Russian Empire and its royal family. Let us begin to see where did this come from? Where did the Soviet Union, where did this new poison, this new germ, this new pandemic come from? The Soviet Union communism. Well, let's get back to Tsar Nicholas II. Uh, second cousin, to the Kaiser, first cousin to the uh, British King George during the First War. Now, his official title, his official title was Nicholas II, Emperor and Autocrat of all the Russias. To the Russian Orthodox Church, to this day, he is known as Nicholas the Passion Bearer or Nicholas the Martyr. However, However, to his critics, increasingly over the early 1900s, he is known as Bloody Nicholas. That is because of the massacres on Bloody Sunday and after. That is because of the secret police that arrest thousands and send them off to Siberia. There is massive repression from 1900 to 1915. There is massive repression of the Russian people. Also, the pogroms, don't forget, those anti-Jewish attacks supported by the Russian government, oftentimes encouraged by the Russian government, because, again, it gives you someone to blame. Bloody Nicholas increasingly becomes his moniker. Personality. Well, most historians agree that he was actually quite a good man. If you look at private letters, uh, correspondence, diaries, there is a lot of historical evidence pointing to his personal charm, his gentleness, his love of family, a deep religious faith, and a strong Russian patriotism. We're not talking about that. That's, we're not talking about that. That's good. That's fantastic. But essentially... He was a bad czar. He was the wrong man at the wrong time. He simply appeared in the wrong place in history. And that happens. That certainly happens. He was raised in the lap of luxury. Um, this is his mother. Uh, he was raised as the future czar of the Russias, as it was known. Um, that is his father, Alexander III. Now, Alexander III, planned to live longer than he did. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? He shielded the young prince from all education when it comes to statecraft. He believed, Alexander III, we will wait until the young prince is 30, and then we'll begin to educate him on how 
to rule this empire. Um, that leaves this young czar completely ill-prepared for the job that is coming his way. Here are the Romanovs, a family German by blood, spoke French at court. The, the, the family of Russia. Well, Tsar Alexander the Third dies, and the young Tsar Nicholas the Second is made the Tsar, completely ill prepared, completely ill prepared. Um. Age 26, uh, he had learned very little as far as education goes. And he was left quite a shallow man who relied on advisors, who believed so much in the uh, role of the czar as the great father, as the little father, as he was called, actually, um, that he ignored Warning after warning after warning. He was so confident in this system that this system had lasted hundreds of years. There's no reason why it won't last uh, forever. The Russian people love me and I love them. Proof, proof of how disconnected he was with reality during the uh, Japanese-Russian War. When his fleet is wiped out at Tsushima, um, He's playing tennis, and they run over, and they go, "Your Highness, Your Majesty, uh, we've we've lost the fleet. We've lost the fleet off of the coast of Korea." Uh, he read the telegraph, stuffs in his pocket, and goes back to playing tennis. I think I told you this story before, but that shows you how disconnected he was from reality. Well, then I guess we'll just send more. It doesn't work that way, uh, 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 Your Majesty. Uh, while a young man, he marries uh, the love of his life, Alexandria. Um, she is a, a German princess. She is the granddaughter of Queen Victoria. Um, by the way, Nicholas is also, I think, a second cousin of Queen Victoria, but that's okay. It's all in the family. This is the way we do it with the aristocracy in Europe. She was deeply religious, somewhat paranoid, German. Keep that in mind. The Russian people will never trust her. They will never like her. Traditionally, the Germans are the enemies of Russia, very similar to Marie Antoinette and France. That being said, they were well-suited. They seemed to get along very, very, very well. They were very much in love with each other and will proceed to have a family. Here they are with uh, 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 the Tsarina's grandmother, Queen Victoria. Remember, Queen Victoria is going to populate many of the royal families throughout Europe, hoping to spread constitutional monarchy and liberal ideals throughout Europe. There is the czar. On the far right is the uh, one-day King of England, George. And this is the man who they looked so very similar. They were dressed in each other's clothes. Uh, it was, it's, it's somewhat eerie how, how very similar they looked. Look at that. The Kaiser is a second cousin of the uh, Tsar, but a first cousin of the King of England, George. Nicholas was a committed family man. He absolutely ad adored his family. He had many, many beautiful children. Here they are, the daughters and the prized uh, uh, crown prince, Alexei. Now, these images have been colorized, but I think they give you so much more of an insight. It makes it feel much, so much more human when we can see these images in color. But we are transitioning. First World War, by this time, color photography, which comes out in the late 1800s, uh, believe it or not, uh, is becoming somewhat more common. Still, the average person does not have access to this until the 1960s, but we're starting to see color images. This is the royal family. Here is the imperial family on vacation in Crimea, on the Black Sea. Here, the emperor is doing something now that would get him canceled. <laughs> it was a different time, guys. It was a different time. Come on. I love these images, though. It gives tremendous insight. Absolutely gorgeous family. Playing dress up. This is a somewhat candid photograph, them eating supper as a family. 
There is the Zarovich of Russia, the prince. This is the future, guys. You can have a thousand daughters, but we need a son. We need a son, and we got him. Thank God we got our son. We have to keep him happy. We have to keep him healthy. He has to survive because he is our future. He is our future. Keep this in mind. There he is. He was the apple of his parents' eye. Fair, more than fair. He's the future of the Russian Empire. This is the future of the Russian Empire. The Imperial family, the Romanovs, they live in absolute luxury. We've seen these images before of all the crown heads of Europe. Even if their people are starving, they live appointed by God. And so why shouldn't they live like angels? Or at least that's the justification. Gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Central beliefs of the czar. Remember, he's an autocrat. They have a Duma. They have a, uh, a parliament, but he rules absolutely. He can veto it, dissolve it at any time. So his beliefs become policy, right, of the Russian Empire. He was a deeply conservative ruler. Uh, he maintained a strict authoritarian regime, uh, more so than even in Austria and Germany. He rules absolutely. This is something that we would have seen in Europe in the 16 and 1700s. Russia has always been behind Western Europe uh, in many ways, including styles of rule. Individuals and society in general were expected to do four things. Show self-restraint. They were supposed to have devotion to the community. Respect the social hierarchy. Respect the social hierarchy. If you are a peasant, you give reverence, respect to your social betters, the upper classes. Uh, a sense of duty to the country. He is not only a a, a temporal leader, a, a a secular leader. He is a religious leader, um, and the Russian Orthodox Church, even though not everyone were members, was what kept society together and all were expected to show uh, faith and devotion to god the emperor russia the church etc here he is at his coronation he is being anointed this is god places him on earth to rule a rebellion against the czar is a rebellion against god's wishes this is what is taught this is what is believed this is what is certain he is God's representative on earth. Raise your hand to him. You are smiting God himself. This is what children are taught. Those royal regalia, that royal regalia is, 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 is an earthly representation of God's support and God's want for him to rule over us there he is leaving the cathedral after being crowned he tied himself to russia more than any other monarch he is russia this is what he tells his children the russian people and so when things begin to go bad in russia they look to the czar. If you're going to take credit for all that is good, well, then you must take credit for things that go bad. And this is what happens. He ties himself so much to the land itself, the people themselves. He's the little father that when things begin to go bad, and they certainly will, his rule comes into question. The effects of this sort of rule the Russian people was ruled, the Russian people, the Russian empire was ruled from the top by a sovereign who had one idea of government to preserve intact the absolute monarchy given to him by his father. However, and that's a capital H, however, Nicholas lacked the intellect, the energy or training for his job. He fell back on favorites, personal whims. Um, he could be incredibly stubborn. Nicholas assumed that the Russian people were 
devoted to him with unquestionable loyalty. And this is where he will make a pivotal mistake because time and time again, his advisors will come to him and ask him to make certain concessions and he'll refuse it. So sure is he with this re imperial relationship with his subjects. He is Russia. He rules Russia. His family rules Russia. And he has to leave this for his son. That's his one job. He got this from his father. He has to leave it as is or better to his son so that his son may rule as have the Romanovs since the early 1600s. However, there is rising discontent in Russia. Rising discontent even before the First World War. In the revolution of 1905, as you will recall, um, the Tsar made certain concessions. He promised to introduce representative government, the Duma, that very quickly um, is proven to be symbolic. It doesn't mean anything. He can dissolve it. He can veto it. It is a it is a, a legislative body that lacks any sort of teeth. He used his returning troops, remember, back from Japan to crush revolt, to imprison, to massacre. He will rule following the 1905 revolution as an autocrat. Nothing changes. In some ways, they get worse. The peasantry increasingly, increasingly begin to suffer. Now, in 1861, serfdom was banned that law that tied people to the land that is very medieval. That is banned. However, peasants still work land that is not their own. They pay taxes to the state and they begin to they begin to whisper. They begin to shout. They begin to demand more rights. They want land that is their own. They want more of a say in their daily lives. By 1914, Russia consisted mainly of poor farming peasants with 1.5% of the population owning 25% of the land. To be a Russian peasant was incredibly difficult at any time. I mean, now is not great, quite frankly, but in the early 1900s, little had gotten better. This man traveled the countryside of Russia with a camera using color film. Now, this is real. This hasn't been retouched to document life in the countryside. Oh, Prokutin Gorsky. I'm, I know I butchered it. I apologize. But that man, he traveled the countryside. And this gives us tremendous insight. I just love these images. You're going to have to excuse me. But these are color images from the early 1900s of Russian peasants. Traveling through Russia in the early 1900s is like traveling through the rest of Europe in the late 1700s. Again, it's not a judgment on Russia by any means, but Russia moves slowly. She's a very large, grand nation, and so she would be somewhat behind the rest of the world. A Russian would say, well, we don't adopt every fad. We take our time. We think things out. Now, it's very easy in these images to get lost, but just know famine was a constant fear. Working on land that is not your own. The aristocracy and the church have absolute say over everything. Remember, those Napoleonic revolutions of the early 1800s, there was an attempt in Russia but did not succeed. Gorgeous. Now, don't forget how multi-ethnic Russia is. It's an empire. And so over the centuries, it has taken over more and more territory. We're not just discussing Russians. And so this photographer captured a great many um, other groups within the Russian empire, including Central Asian Muslims, a gourd salesman. 
beautiful. This is an empire, multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-religious polyglot, speaking of many different languages. All under the rule of one man, the czar. Gorgeous. Look at those shoes. <laughs> I don't know what these guys did, but they did something. They did something. This is a Persian rug salesman, I assume. Not necessarily Persian. Here are some Russians receiving electricity for the first time in 1920. By 1920, uh, less than 1% of Russians had electricity. And there was nothing like what was being seen in Europe and the United States even by 1920, Russia is well behind. A Russian would not know what to do if you dropped them in 1920, Berlin, uh, 1920, uh, London. A century ahead of the Russians, even their cities were nothing compared to, say, New York City or even Turlock, California. Small towns in the United States still would have shocked, shocked the uh, Russian people, even those in cities. That being said, just so you know, only 35% of Americans had electricity by 1920. Let me give you another little tidbit. In 1967, there was a survey done in Britain, in Britain, that found that only 25%, that found that 25% of homes in England and Wales still lacked a bath or a shower, an indoor toilet, a sink, and hot and cold water taps. That's Britain. In 1967, the 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 Britain of the Beatles. So just before we start judging the Russians too harshly, industrialization and urbanization. Russia industrialized and urbanized long after Western Europe and the United States. By 1900, there were only two major cities: Saint Petersburg, which, by the way, was changed to Petrograd during the war, but I'm not, I'm just going to, I'll call it St. Petersburg and Moscow. Um, by 1900, St. Petersburg had a population of approximately 1.2 million people. Moscow had a, a population of approximately a million people. Why were people pouring into cities by the early 1900s in Russia? The chance of a better life. The chance of a better life. You go to the city, you work in factories, you might be exposed to new material goods that you would have never had a chance to uh, uh, accumulate in the countryside. As bad as life was in the city, and it was, and we'll get into that, um, at least there's a the chance at something better. The... Russian cities don't even hit the top 10 mark. Uh, my uh, uh, face has blocked, unfortunately, um, these uh, uh, cities. But just know at the top is London. Um, and then you have uh, uh, New York, Paris, Berlin, Tokyo, Chicago. They have populations in the many millions by this time. Uh, that being said, there is an increase in urban living in Russia. In some of these locales, there is a population increase of 400%. People begin pouring into the cities for factory work. They begin pouring into the cities for factory work. That being said, Russia is not an industrialized nation. It is not considered an industrialized nation. They have factories, certainly, but it is still very much a rural agricultural nation. Now, when people pour into cities, they are exposed to a great many things. This is before, uh, of course, the internet, of course, television, uh, before radio. And so if you're living in a village, you don't get exposed to, to, to many ideas. Well, in the cities, you do. And people in the cities begin to get exposed to ideas like representative government. What? Civil liberties. Wait, what? Having a say in your future. Wait, what? Religious toleration. Wait, what? They get exposed to that virus that was that was first coughed out <coughs> during the French Revolution. Keep that in mind, because millions of people are now pouring in 
to urban centers, being exposed to new ideas. Keep that in the back of your mind. Working conditions were absolutely abhorrent for your average Russian factory worker. Now, they were terrible for the British and the Americans in the 1800s. By the 1900s, things have improved somewhat, not for the Russians. By 1914, the average work week was six days a week, 10 hours a day. By the time the war breaks out, your average worker is working between 11 and 12 hours a day. There is a constant risk of injury, death, harsh discipline in these factories. Because of late industrialization, workers in Russia were highly concentrated. What do I mean? You have these massive factories, 40%. 40% of Russian workers were employed in factories of a 1,000 or more workers. You do not see that in Germany, Britain, or the United States. You have many smaller factories, not in Russia. You have these massive, massive factories of a 1,000-plus workers. That is a recipe for disaster. These massive factories can go on strike, shutting a country down. These massive factories can uh, communicate within them. Uh, uh, and so when you have in America, you might have 200 striking workers. In Russia, you might have 2,000 striking workers. Please keep this in mind as well. It's a recipe for disaster. And when the war breaks out, the demands on workers are even greater. You're expected to work longer hours, um, oftentimes for less wages. For the war effort, you have to do it for Russia, for your little father. Keep this in mind as well. Living conditions. Well, the rapid industrialization led to rapid urbanization, right? These cities blow up in population overnight. From 1890 to 1910, St. Petersburg goes from about 1 million to about 2 million. Moscow experiences very similar growth patterns. In one 1904 survey, it was found that an average of 16 people shared each apartment in St. Petersburg with six people per room. The living conditions of these cities were absolutely abhorrent. Uh, no running water, no toilets, human waste running down the sides of gutters. Disease could break out at any time. Um, these cities, very similar for the record to parts of London, Chicago, and New York in the 1800s, well, they're experiencing that now in the 1900s, just like many parts of China are experiencing uh, rapid urbanization and industrialization. They, they uh, too, came to industrialization and urbanization very late. But these were not fantastic places to live. Now, were your chances at improving your lives so much be somewhat better in the city than in the countryside? Yeah, this is why people came. Um, if you're wondering, that's a hat dealer. He's not... He's not trying to show off how many hats he can afford. He's, he's selling hats. Um, but life in general was particularly bad in these cities. Here is a soup kitchen for the poor, 1911. Very poor, very desperate individuals. A recipe for revolution. Remember, men and women can put up with a lot. But when their stomachs are empty, well, things get very, 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 very volatile. Here are a group of ruffians on the street. You can see some of them have black eyes, no less. Let me tell you the average life expectancy by 1900 of the Russians. Well, I'll tell you to compare and contrast. 1900. In the United States, the average life expectancy was about 47 years of age. Now, remember, we are taking child and infant mortality into account. Right, It's not like your average person died at 47, but we are taking infant mortality rates and mortality rates in general, and that makes the average. The United States was 47 years of age. Great Britain in 1900, average life expectancy, 46. France, 45. They're all hovering around the same general spot. Uh, Russia was 30. Okay, So 17 years on average less in Russia than the United States at the same time. Life is not great for your average Russian. Please keep this in mind. The effects. Well, this created a new proletariat. The proletariat are the working classes. This is a term used by Marx, which due to being crowded together in cities was much more likely to protest and go on strike than the peasantry had been in previous 
times. You can isolate villages. You can isolate regions. And this is how Russia remained so autocratic. When they're concentrated in cities, it is a much more difficult task. Look at Paris during the revolution. The French Revolution was really the Parisian Revolution that affected all of France. This is going to happen in Russia. It's the cities that are really going to revolt. World War. World War will bring fundamental changes to the empire of Russia. Now, one of the czar's principal reasons for going into this war against Germany, the enemy, the traditional enemy of the Russian people was to build a popularity, to bring the country together, to make the citizens forget that they're hungry and focus on destroying the German empire. He had tried that against the Japanese. It didn't work, but he thought this time, this time it will work. We will create a sense, a greater sense of national unity. We will bring together all of these diverse factions of Russia, all these different ethnic groups, all these political parties, all these different factions. I say political parties. It's not like they have a party system. I mean political factions, groups. We will be brought together in our fight against those Germans, those evil, evil Germans. This is what he believes. This is what he believes. Again, he believes that war will make himself more uh, uh, popular, stronger, and secure the position of czar for his son, the future czar. In the beginning... I wouldn't say it was super popular, but it was somewhat popular in many parts of Russia, the war. Here is a crowd greeting the Tsar outside the Winter Palace, 1914. However, the effects of the war, the war, <laughs> the war soon take hold. Very quickly, the draft is instituted, and that will pull unwilling soldiers from across the empire. The demand for factory production and war supplies will cause many labor strikes because these workers are pushed and pushed and pushed. The draft will pull skilled workers from the city, put them into the army. And so what we have now are peasants from the country coming in to fill those factory jobs. Well, our factories don't run nearly as efficiently with these unskilled peasant laborers. And then famine hits. Famine will hit the Russian people because supplies are going to the front to the soldiers and because of the poor rail system um, the Russian people suddenly are much more hungry the factories are slowed down there is uh, labor strikes labor shortages the good strong capable men are sent to the front the czar will lose his most loyal men in the first year of this war, he will lose some of his most loyal officers in the first year of this war. And increasingly, he is relying on conscripts, men that were drafted into the war who are not particularly loyal to the czar, not particularly loyal to Russia itself. Many of these are ethnic minorities that had been conquered by Russia just 100 years earlier. Casualties and conditions. Russian soldiers went hungry, lacked shoes, lacked ammunition, even sometimes weapons. They would be sent to the front without a gun. The hope was you could pick up a gun from one of your dead comrades on the battlefield, or you could get one from your enemy. They're, they're literally being sent to the front without guns. By the end of 1914, by the end of 1914, 390,000 Russian men had lost their lives with nearly 1 million injured. They were no match for German troops. The Austrians, eh, the Germans, they're no match for those German-trained and equipped troops. The Germans do very well against the Russians, and they're fighting a two-front war, which is somewhat impressive. The Russians are driven out of Austria-Hungary. The Germans conquer Lithuania. They conquer Poland. The Russians are now losing land, not just men, land increasingly morale on the front lines gets lower and lower and lower fighting against the germans 
arguably the best land army the world had seen up to that point, at least in modern history, although Napoleon might argue with me. Hundreds of thousands of Russians are taken prisoner by the Germans. Morale is at an all-time low within the Russian army. The effects, well, with good reason, quite frankly, many soldiers did not feel that they were being treated as human beings. They are simply uh, being sent as raw materials to be chewed up and spat out by wealthy elites. Increasingly, the feeling is this is a rich man's war being fought by poor men. In the fall of 1915, the Tsar dismisses his uncle, the Grand Duke Nicholas, as commander-in-chief of the military. Nicholas, the Tsar, takes over the command himself. He moves from the palace to the front. He takes over control of his army. A very noble exercise the most wise no he has no real military training but he believes that a good father leads from the front and so he goes to take over his armies as commander-in-chief by uh, the fall of 1915 again when you put yourself in the front when things go badly they look to you as the man responsible. He leaves St. Petersburg and goes to the front. Here he is blessing his troops. Remember, he is God's representation on earth. Receive a blessing from the czar and you are receiving a blessing from God himself. He leaves in his place his beloved wife, Alexandra. Again, German by birth, incredibly stubborn herself, deeply religious, and hated by the Russian people and the nobility. Well, while the Tsar is off commanding his armies, increasingly the nobility and the general people of Russia begin to get very unnerved by the fact that there is an Orthodox monk who is, in all appearances, running the country. Who am I talking about? Who am I talking about? Well, Grigory Rasputin, known to history simply as Rasputin, a very, very dark and mysterious figure in world history. He was born to a peasant family in Siberia. His past has many holes, but he marries a young lady. We'll have several children with her, although I believe only three survive. I think they have seven, but this is the life of a Russian peasant. He was a Orthodox monk, not a priest or official member of the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, a mystic, a prolific womanizer. By looking at him, God bless him, you wouldn't think womanizer, would you? Um, and he claimed to be able to heal the sick. He is a mystic. He travels to um, Constantinople, to Greece, to Jerusalem. He is very charismatic. He is very alluring, very dark, mysterious. He's everything that you think a, a, an Eastern mystic would be. And increasingly, while the Tsar is gone, it seems that Rasputin has a hold over the Empress. In fact, he has a hold over many members of St. Petersburg uh, society. Many of the wealthy women go and they sit and they chat with Rasputin. He's intoxicating. He seduces them figuratively and literally in many cases. In 1905, he first meets the royal family. He grows closer and closer to the royal family. Why? What's key to Rasputin becoming so close to the royal family. Well, it seems he is the only man who can cure a very sick prince. You see, Alexei suffered. He was a sickly child. He was, an, he, he was a hem, hemophiliac, pardon me. A hemophiliac, essentially, is someone who does, when they bleed, when they bleed, 
um, their blood doesn't clot. And so if they're cut, they just keep bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. It might be from an injury that they will bleed and bleed. Sometimes it'll just be their nose and it won't stop. It won't stop. Alexei suffers from this. He suffers from this. In fact, we can thank Victoria for that. Hemophilia affects many of the great houses of Europe by the early 1900s, and that is because of Victoria. She carried the gene that gave it to the rest of Europe. Remember, she married off of all of her children and her grandchildren. Well, it didn't affect the women, but it affected the men. The men, the women carried it. The men got it. And so all across Europe, by the early 1900s, we are having very sickly young princes. That is the gift that Victoria unwittingly gave to Europe. But Gregory can cure him. It's amazing. He'll be sick for days. Gregory will come. Rasputin will come. And within a few hours, he's good. God. There were rumors that actually Rasputin would poison a kid when he came to visit him. And then he'll be brought back. Give him the cure. Drink this. And you're good. Oh, Rasputin. Only Rasputin can help my poor child. She becomes devoted to Rasputin while the czar is gone. He appoints church officials, cabinet ministers. It even comes out that Rasputin appears to be making military decisions while the czar is gone. Even more rumors are abound about Rasputin sitting in the palace, a peasant, a mystic, a drunk, a womanizer. It comes to be believed that he is the true ruler of Russia right now. That's why we're doing so badly in the war. This is why I don't have bread, because Rasputin has seduced the royal family. They are in his liege. These are propaganda images from the time. Something needs to be done. Something needs to be done. There were even more sordid rumors, tantalizing rumors, which we won't get into. Incredibly not true. She was incredibly devout, very religious. But again, like Marie Antoinette, these rumors, especially against women, right, in history, um, are very powerful. They do a lot to, to, to bring down the esteem of the royal family. Something needs to be done. Well, a group of nobles, a group of nobles, right-wing nobles within the uh, 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 Russian aristocracy, invite Rasputin to the palace, to a palace, the Yusupov Palace. We are going to drink. We're going to uh, discuss things. Might be, maybe we'll play cards. There might even be girls there for you, Rasputin. He goes, never one to turn down some free liquor and food. They bring him down to the basement where they have something of a party. Well, they ply him with food, wine, food, wine. The man had a voracious appetite of everything, everything. Well, they laced this meal and wine with incredible amounts of cyanide, enough to kill an elephant. It doesn't work. He just keeps eating. He just keeps eating, keeps drinking. Like, my God. Well, finally, one of the nobles pulls out a revolver, shoots him, bam, several times. He's dead. He falls down. The conspirators are discussing, all right, what do we do now? They look over. He's up. He's trying to run out. What do they do? They unload the gun into him, beat the living hell out of him. Finally, he's not moving. They roll him up. They throw him in the river. Rasputin is dead. Thank God. Into the frozen river he goes. Well, several days later, they find Rasputin, pull him out of the river. He had water in his lungs, meaning he was still alive. He drowned. He drowned. It wasn't bullets. It wasn't uh, the beating of a club. It wasn't the poison. It was the drowning. The man was uh, uh, something to behold. There is the bullet on the front of his head. Um, well, the killing of Rasputin and some of the conspirators will be sent off um, into um, uh, 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 Siberia or, or, or no, I don't know if they were sent to Siberia. Uh, they, 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 they had to leave. They had to leave Russia. I'm, I'm not aware. I'm not sure where they went. Um, this leaves the Empress. This leaves the Empress in a state of paranoia. Terror. Frustration. 
because in her mind and the mind of the czar, Rasputin was the only man that could protect and heal their son, and they've killed him. They've killed him. The uh, conspirators are in exile, but they're after us. They're after us. That was personal. That was against us, the royal family. During all of this, there's economic collapse. During all of this, there is economic collapse. By the end of 1915, the economy was already breaking down. The main problems were food shortages, rising prices. People suffered. Women, women especially suffered. The men are off to war or working in the factories. Women reportedly spent 40 hours a week in food lines. Women begged. Women turned to prostitution, crime. They tore down wooden fences just to keep stoves heated for warmth. And all the time, they are grumbling. They are grumbling. More and more people, what began as whispers, now become outright statements. You know who's to blame for this? The czar. The czar is to blame for this. Government officials begin to worry. Remember, the czar has secret police. They know what's coming. They issue a report. They issue a report. The security police issue a report to the uh, czar. They say, quote, the possibility in the near future of riots by the lower classes of the empire enraged by the burdens of daily existence is a reality. The Duma, the Duma issues a warning to the czar saying you need to bring in more representation you need to bring in reforms you need to let the people think that they have a stake in this or we are facing revolution and what does the czar do he ignores them in typical fashion the czar ignores them this might have worked had the war began to go well for russia it's not it is not by the end of october 1916 russia had lost between 1.6 and 1.8 million soldiers dead. On top of that, 2 million prisoners of war taken by the Central Powers and a million more are missing. That's about 5 million missing fathers, brothers, husbands, etc. The Russian people can bear no more. Things beget, begin to get much more dangerous for the royal family, and we are entering revolution. Note, there is no single leader, organization, or political ideology behind this February revolution, which actually occurs in March. That's the Russian uh, 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 calendar, okay? So just know that it occurs in March. Uh, it really begins in March 1917 with massive strikes hitting St. Petersburg. By March 10th, virtually every industrial operation in St. Petersburg, has been shut down. Um, it's not just workers who take to the streets. Students, white-collar workers, teachers, join these industrial workers on the streets of Russia, and violence will soon break out. They want a great many things, but mostly the average person wants bread and an end to the slaughter of their male family members against Germany. Massive protests in all the major cities of Russia. Burning of royal regalia and symbols. Again, we blame the little father for our problems. You can't take the good and ignore the bad. Government reaction. Well, first thing... The czar does is he shuts down the Duma, which was very foolish because it gave the appearance that there was no government action. Uh, there was no government uh, 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 overseance. It, it gave the appearance that the government was in a state of chaos. He shuts down the Duma. He doesn't dissolve it, but he shuts it down and he looks to the army. Now, there were 180,000 troops available in the capital. However, most were untrained and or injured. About 12,000 were considered reliable, and it's those soldiers that the czar sends out to squash this rebellion. The czar is not in the city. He is still out on the front. However, very quickly, these soldiers prove themselves, A, not to be very loyal to the czar, B, unwilling to shoot into crowds that include women. 
children, their neighbors. It soon becomes very apparent that the czar and his government does not have the loyalty of the army, at least in the cities. The best and the most loyal are off fighting Germans. By March 15, on his way back to the capital, the czar, surrounded by his ministers and advisors and military officials, under tremendous pressure, abdicates. He abdicates in the name of himself and his son. Okay, we're done. I'm sorry. He abdicates. He abdicates the throne. Had he given a little bit, had he given a little bit, things might have been different. That is a misprint, the March 2nd, just so you know. <laughs> he is sent to house arrest to the Alexander Palace with his family while a new government is established in Russia. The provisional government. The provisional government. Now, the provisional government, the provisional government was made up of mostly conservatives who wanted to see a modern government made up of the wealthy and the elite. These are not radicals. These are not radicals. This is a conservative revolution. There's going to be no murder. There's going to be no uh, property uh, transfers. There's going to be no issuing of 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 of, of, of modern civil liberties. The what you would see in France, Britain, and the United States. Also, this new provisional government is committed to continuing to fight Germany. They're committed to continuing to fight the war in Germany. So we might we don't have a czar anymore. We have somewhat of a representative government, but we are committed to continuing our war against Germany. However, radicals, including socialists and other radical groups, have formed their own government, uh, and that is the Petrograd Soviet. A Soviet is a council, and these have emerged during this revolution. These are councils of elected representatives, and the Petrograd Soviet says that the provisional government represents the bourgeoisie, the people with money, the people with titles. We represent the workers. We represent the uh, peasantry. So, in essence, you have two governments claiming authority over the uh, Russian people. The Petrograd Soviet claims... We are not here to rule over Russia. We are here as a pressure group to apply pressure to the uh, provisional government to make sure that they pass certain provisions, such as the Soviet, the Petrograd Soviet want civil rights for all Russians. They want a democratic police and army, and they want the abolition of religious and ethnic discrimination. For the time being, for a short, brief time, both of them ruling from the Turid Palace in St. Petersburg, two separate houses, there is a dual power relationship. There is a dual power. The provisional government is in power, but they promise to listen to the Petrograd Soviet made up of more radical members of this revolutionary uh, 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 mass body, revolutionary body. Okay, sorry, my brain went... <laughs> For the time being, things are good. For the well, not good, not good. It's a shaky government. So you have the provisional government, conservative, but you also have in the cities, the Soviet, um, and they are much more radical, and they want to put pressure on the um, provisional government to make more changes. This is not going to be a conservative revolution if the Soviets have anything to do with it. But things are going to change. Things are going to change with the decision by the Kaiser. What did he do during this time? Well, this is when he sends a young Bolshevik radical in a sealed train car across Germany from Switzerland into Russia. This is the plan. This is the plan. We want to bring down this provisional government because they want to continue the war against Russia. This germ is going to be even worse than any other germ that the aristocracy and the powers that be had seen up to this point. And the Germans know what they're doing, just like they play with germ warfare in the trenches. We are playing with ideological germ warfare 
in Russia. That man they sent to Russia in a sealed train car was Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. He, from a young age, is a devoted Marxist revolutionary. It's in his DNA. It's in his blood. He sees in Marx a solution to all the problems. Now, Marx said revolution is coming naturally. We don't have to even start it. It's going to come. Marx argued that religion, nations, aristocracies, hierarchies in general are all inventions of those who have to continue to rule over those who do not have, whether it be lies about heaven, patriotism, it's all nonsense. Lenin sucks that in. Lenin sucks all of this in. It makes complete sense to Lenin, as it does many other people in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Now, Marx, when he penned with Engels, the Communist Manifesto, argued that revolution is going to inevitably happen, but in industrialized nations. You have to reach the industrial stage before you hit the revolutionary and finally the socialist communist stage. Marx was talking about revolution occurring in the United Kingdom, France, Germany, the United States. It was not going to happen in Russia. No, you have to have an industrialized population. This is how it Marxism works. Lenin's going to disagree with this, and we'll get to how he disagrees in a bit. But he believes that you can skip the industrialized stage and go straight to the revolutionary stage. His brother was... Uh, put to death over his uh, Lenin's brother was put to death over his involvement in the assassination of Alexander the uh, second, the grandfather of Nicholas the um, second. He is a fully committed revolutionary. He will spend three years in Siberia and then he is exiled from Russia and he jumps around from Geneva, London, um, here, there. He'll spend some time in, in Munich. Um, he develops his interpretation of Marxism. Lenin's interpretation of Marxism, his ideas of revolution are going to shift somewhat. It is Lenin who leads a split from the Social Democrat Labor Party. He splits. He calls his group the Bolshevik, the majority. That's what it means. They are the ones that believe that we can create a revolution without the industrial stage. The minority of this party, the uh, uh, Mensheviks, which Lenin called the majority very cleverly, he names the Mensheviks, the moderates who don't believe that we can uh, go straight to revolution from in, without industrialization. He calls them the minority. He calls his group the Bolsheviks, the majority. These people believe that we can skip the industrialized stage with a dedicated, well-read uh, uh, a vanguard leaders of the revolution can radicalize the peasants, and the workers and go straight to the revolutionary stage. And so he split the, uh, um, the social democratic, uh, labor party, pardon me. This is the application of Marxism, but to Russian society. Marx never spoke about a revolution in places like Russia or China. Interestingly, that's where these communist revolutions take place. Central beliefs. Well, on the train from Switzerland to Russia, Lenin composes his famous April Theses, his program for the Bolshevik Party. He's headed back to Russia, back to the a nation in chaos. He believed in five central things. Number one, the revolution can skip the industrialized stage. Number two, the peasants and workers must be radicalized. Number three, the revolution must be led by a vanguard, elite party members, not the common people. No, 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 no. Party leaders, elites within the party. Um, Russia must not become a bourgeoisie parliamentary nation. Openly speaks out against this provisional government. You can't replace one boss with a new boss. And finally, industry must be nationalized or socialized and aristocratic lands seized. This is a key component. We need to take over their lands, redistribute it among the peasantry, and industry will be taken over by the state, the government. The Germans have unleashed a virus. He is going to radicalize. Russia during this 
intermediate time. Furthermore, Lenin calls for the immediate withdrawal of Russia from the First World War. That is key. That is why the Germans sent him. He wants an end to Russian involvement in the war. The provisional government doesn't. This is why the Kaiser agrees to send in this virus. Growth. The Bolsheviks were never the majority, but they were the best organized. Please keep that in mind. Just like in the French Revolution. It doesn't matter the numbers you have. It means how well organized you are. Just like the radicals during the French Revolution. It is going to grow. The Bolshevik faction is going to grow. In February of 1917, there were 24,000 members of Lenin's Bolshevik faction. By September of 1917, there were 200,000 members of the Bolshevik faction. They become the majority in both Moscow and St. Petersburg, never the countryside. Lenin was a prolific speaker, organizer. Um, he instilled hope, anger, and action from his devotees. This movement, this Bolshevik faction is going to grow and grow. Now, these guys are communists. These guys are revolutionaries. The banner says, down with the 10 capitalist ministers, all power to the Soviets of workers, soldiers, and peasant deputy deputies. Now, the provisional government tried to deal with the Bolsheviks. They tried to put them down. It's so funny. We condemned the czar for shooting down protesters and revolutionaries. But as soon as the provisional government comes into power, they do the same thing. And that is repeated time and time again in all revolutions. The Bolsheviks are armed. They are organized. And they begin to take over parts of the cities. They begin to wrestle power from this moderate provisional government. They capture the Winter Palace. They will soon capture the government itself. As much as the provisional government tried, they couldn't get rid of this virus that the Germans had unleashed on Russia. The October Revolution. This is the communist revolution within the revolution. This is when things begin to get much more radical. The Russian uh, the October Revolution replaced Russia's short-lived provisional parliamentary government with a government by the Soviets, those local councils made up of workers, peasants, etc. At first, at first, membership to the Soviets was freely elected. However, 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 the Bolsheviks soon saw that many people disagreed with them, including other leftists like the anarchists, uh, the uh, 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 socialists disagreed with the Bolsheviks. And so very quickly, very quickly, they barred all non-Bolsheviks from the Soviets. This is not going to be a democracy. This is going to be a Bolshevik-led nation and a Bolshevik-led uh, a series of reforms will follow. All of Europe and the United States shudder. Extremists, extremists rise to power in Russia. The Bolsheviks have taken over the government. The palace is locked and guarded. We are not allowing any people that disagree with us into the government. Terribly sorry. It is Lenin who keeps good to his word and makes peace with the central powers. He makes peace with the central powers. The result, peace for Germany on the Eastern Front and a, a massive land loss for the empire, or the empire's gone, pardon me, Russia itself. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. I butchered it. I'm not going to say it again. You can see how it is spelled. You say it. This treaty that the Germans push on the Russians is very severe. Many argue much more severe or as severe as the treaty that will be pushed on the Germans themselves. Russia renounces all claims to Estonia, Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine. Poland is carved up by Austria and Germany. Under this treaty, Russia loses 26% of its population, 37% of its agricultural land, 28% of its industry, 26% of its railway tracks, and three quarters of its coal and iron deposits. All 
most of Russia's wealth was in that Western European strip. It's gone. But Lenin wants to focus on reforms at home. He also has to focus on the royal family. You see, there's a civil war going on. The other side, the anti-Bolshevik side, has not given up. Many Russians are royalists. As long as the royal family is alive, well, they're going to keep fighting and fighting and fighting. Now, the royal family for the last two years has been being shuffled around um, in Siberia from house to house, treated somewhat kindly. You can see their notes. Um, they are not given the sort of lifestyle they're used to. But for the average Russian, they're living quite well. Um, being moved from house to house, there were several discussions over whether um, we could uh, 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 rescue them. There was even discussion of secretly saving the royal family and moving them to England. The Tsar knew that his cousin George would help him. Well, his cousin George is brought to attention this plan, and he doesn't. He says, no, leave him. I, don't, I can't have my cousin here. Because the British were afraid that if they were seen to be saving the Tsar, then that would create a, 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 a revolution in Britain. And so the king of England allows his cousin to remain uh, a virtual prisoner by the Bolsheviks. Here is the royal family in peasant garb. The days of palace living are well behind them. This is the last known photograph of the prince, Alexei. Something needs to be done. Again, as I said, as long as these people are alive, you're going to have these uh, royalists continue to fight against the revolution. Um, we have these beautiful photographs. Again, very different from the photographs I showed you at the beginning of this lesson. But something needs to be done. Something needs to be done. This is the last known photo of the Romanovs. They are taken to a basement in one of these safe houses, and they are executed. They are executed, all of them, by a firing squad. Now, the royal family had sewn in their clothes many of their crown jewels to hide from the Bolsheviks. They were sure that when this war's over, we don't want to lose our jewels. And so according to legend, when these Bolsheviks begin firing on the royal family, some of their bullets are flying off. And some of these Bolsheviks thought, my God, they really are gods. They really are holy. Our bullets are bouncing off of them. No, it was the jewels that they had hidden, sewn between their clothes. They're dead. They are dead. And the Romanovs, a family that had ruled Russia since the early 1600s, is gone. It is gone. Not the last royal house to fall during the First World War. Here are some of the assassins, or not assassins, ex executioners, um, where the royal family were buried. Reforms. Lenin does go about reforming. He certainly does. Um, the Lenin administration uh, redistributes land among the peasantry after seizing land from large landowners. They nationalized the banks and nationalized large-scale industry, took over the government took it over. They opened up more access to education as well as introducing literacy programs, teaching to read millions of Russians. They also improved labor rights, introducing the eight-hour workday. They also, they also instituted terror, absolute terror. This was a totalitarian dictatorship which oversaw the killings of uh Hundreds of thousands, the deaths of millions will result from this Leninist administration regime. Translation of the banner, death to the bourgeois and their helpers long live the red terror. The bourgeois are the middle class. Don't think for a minute, don't think for a minute that the terror, that the secret police, that the gulags, that the czar enjoyed went away. They don't. They simply are replaced by party members. They become the new elites of the Soviet Union. Those work camps do not go away. In fact, they increase in number. As soon as the Bolsheviks seize power, there is a civil war. Uh, millions, millions are going to die. 
in this war. Uh, it is between the Bolsheviks against other radical leftists, moderates, royalists. Here are Bolshevik troops in the capital fighting off anti-Bolsheviks. Here are the anti-Bolsheviks. Um, a great many different groups will fight against the Bolsheviks, including other leftists. White Russians were the royalists. If the royal family are gone, we can bring in cousins. Don't worry. We wouldn't, we've done this before, have we not? Brought in other family members uh, from Germany, France, etc. Famine hits Russia from 1921 to 1922 during the Civil War. This is because of Lenin's land seizures, taking away land from landowners who know how to work the land, also because of war. It brings famine to the Russian people. Absolutely terrible. Not just the Russians, by the way. Ukrainians will also feel this. Um, 30 million people will be affected by this famine. 5 million will die. Absolutely terrible. Again, you can look away at any time. These are tough to look at, but this is the reality. This is the reality of what war brought the Russian people. Life goes from bad to worse in many respects for the Russian people, at least during the war, at least during the war. Absolutely terrible, terrible, terrible. This is one of the most chilling photographs ever. A boy who killed his three-year-old brother and ate him. Cannibalism became commonplace in parts of Russia during this time. Here is a Russian street market. The powers that be did not want this virus to win. And so, and so Western governments, as well as Japan, the United States, sent in troops. They sent in troops to try to beat the Bolsheviks. We involve ourselves in a civil war to try to defeat communism. Wait, that sounds very familiar. I'm sure that's the last time the United States is going to involve itself in a civil war to defeat communism, right? That's the last time. We're not going to do that again. That would be ridiculous. The United States will send up to 11,000 troops, and that's nothing. Um, the new nation of Czechoslovakia will send up to 70,000 troops. Japan will send 70,000 troops. Britain will send 60,000 troops. This is the United States and other nations involving ourselves in a civil war to defeat communism. Japanese troops are there to defeat communism. We're all on the same team. This is why later when the Russians and the Americans discussed the Cold War, the Russians were like, no, you started the Cold War. And it began from the very beginning back in uh, the Russian Civil War. Remember, this is an imperial war. And so Canadians on the side of Britain are sent. Indians for Britain are sent to defeat communism. Polish, British, French officers. Polish troops are there to defeat communism well in the end in the end it's not enough it is not enough and after millions of lives lost uh there was no cure there was no vaccine the soviet union is born the soviet un union is established 1922 we have the Soviet Union. The Russian Empire is gone. The Soviet Union is now here. This nation is going to become the new boogeyman of the 1900s. What began in France? What began in France 100 years earlier, more than 100 years earlier, uh, has spread to Russia. Communism was the natural, radical progression of the French Revolution. This idea of liberty, equality, and fraternity. This abstract idea, how do you define equality? How do you get to equality? How do you define liberty? How do you define fraternity, brotherhood? These are abstract ideas that the communists believe they can get to. I'm not saying for a moment that the fathers of the French Revolution would have felt at home with the communists. I'm not saying for a minute that the communists would have felt at home in revolutionary France necessarily. What I'm saying is that this was a natural continuation, some would say a perversion, of those ideals. Rousseau said, so many 
years earlier, that some men need to be forced to be free. Well, what about if you are a slave of your culture, of your nation, of your religion, of your 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 your, your notion of what is right and wrong? Well, then you need to be saved, whether you want to be or not. And the Soviet Union um, will do that. Central to Lenin's idea is that this revolution doesn't stop in Russia. We will support revolutions, communist revolutions around the world. Karl Marx said, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. A worker in Chicago has more in common with a worker in Rome than they do with their neighbor of a different class. And so the communists will support revolutions around the world in the 1900s. Lenin promised it. We are going to clean this world up of its bankers, its aristocrats, its corporate fat cats. Germany becomes especially eager when it comes to communism. The largest communist party after the Soviet revolution will be in Germany outside of Russia. Many Germans will see a solution to their problems following World War I in communism. But it's not just Russia. It's not, I mean, it's not just Germany where this becomes popular. Communism begins to peek its, out, its, its face out throughout Europe, to a lesser degree, the United States. It's seen as an answer against capitalism and the exploitation of the workers of the poor people. Over the 1950s and 1960s, the Soviet Union will support anti-colonial movements in Africa, in Asia. They will encourage Africans, Arabs, Asians to get rid of their colonial masters. They are anti-imperial. This is what they claim, at least, even though they have their own empire. That's not, uh, 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 but I'm just giving you a taste of this poison, how it gets unleashed in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even the 1980s. Communism becomes the new virus of the 1900s. And it was all due to that train car. It will be the Soviets who point to the United States, go, that's freedom. That's freedom with your religion, your fascism, your lynchings. That's freedom. It becomes a counterweight to the popular uh, democratic capitalist argument. And it becomes, as I said, the, the, the new uh, ghoul in the closet. It grows. Communism grows and grows and grows and grows. And for a time being, it really did seem that they were going to take over the world. In 1924, Lenin dies. He had established the first truly socialist state, sent shockwaves across the world, and had giant long-term consequences, thanks to the Kaiser. By the way, the Kaiser now has a giant communist state right next door. This is one of the last photographs taken of Lenin. It might be the last photograph taken of Lenin alive. Um, he deteriorates in health. He becomes more and more of a hermit withheld from the uh, uh, Russian people. He makes statements that when I die, you guys decide, the party decides, not the people, who will be the leader next. You decide. Let the Communist Party decide. It is not me, but in private, in private, in private, and in his personal notes, he said, anyone but Stalin. Anyone but Stalin. Leave it to anyone but Stalin. That man, no. Well, we'll see how that turned out. We'll see how that turned out. <laughs> In our next lesson, we are going to close the First World War as Europe continues to tear itself apart. Thank you all very, 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 very much. I want you to have the best day ever.